First of all, good morning to everyone, and what a wonderful privilege to be here. For me particularly, I look around the room and there are so many people who I have admired over the years, many of whom have been my teachers, my mentors. A lot of you, we've worked together in various countries, and it's just a tremendous treat, and I'm so excited that for the first time we've managed to get together and really push the newborn agenda. But throughout it, there's been this common theme, hasn't there, that it's all about partnerships, and it's all within the ark, as it were. It's not just the newborn. It's not just prematurity. It's not just a single intervention. But it's the ark. And I really love that analogy, Joy. So in this talk, what I'm going to do is take a little corner of the ark, maybe a big corner of the ark, and talk about 15 million babies born too soon. And w I'll skip through very quickly the very first section, which is going to be on pre the preterm burden, because we've heard much of it already. And then begin to sort of weave in a little bit of a, an action story on what's been going on and what is likely to be on the horizons, both in terms of implementation and in terms of the research arenas that Joy had started off on. And then I'll end up again coming back to the same theme again of partnerships. So we've seen the slide, we've heard it, we all know it here, 15 million preterm births. And for, for epidemiologic purposes, we tend to term preterm birth, a birth before 37 completed weeks of gestation. I might provoke you at the end of this conversation as to whether we need to rethink that but at least for the time being and for the data that we have, this is, the, uh, th this is our working uh, basis. And as you can see from this slide, um, the points, the, the, the areas that are shaded darker are where they are the greatest number of preterm births. And perhaps the key that I want to highlight here is that it's a high income country issue it's a middle-income country issue. It's a low-income country issue. So this isn't a situation where one side sits and looks at the other and says, you've got a problem, do we help? This is a global problem. And along with it being a global problem, there's a lot of money associated with it. There's a high, a tremendous burden, again, whether you're in a low-income country setting, a middle-income country setting, or a high-income country setting. So for example, the Institute of Medicine in the US estimated that for the US alone, the preterm birth burden financially is $26 billion. That's more zeros than I can comprehend. When extrapolations have been done to other high-income country settings, it's $40 billion annually. And again, the key here is, because it's all our problem, we have this incredibly unique platform where we can leverage finances, we can leverage investments, we can leverage the learnings to tackle this together as partners. That's to do with the births. What about the deaths? And I'm a little simple and I'm visual. And what strikes me when I see lots of numbers, apart from faces, is what does it mean? And for me, a commercial liner crashing every three hours is, would be, it happens once every month, few months, maybe every few years, and it makes the headlines. When we talk about preterm deaths, this is the equivalent of a commercial airline crashing every three hours. And we're only just beginning to hear about it. There isn't outrage. There isn't that sense of, this is completely unacceptable. There ought to be. This slide illustrates two things which we've all seen and have heard a lot of throughout this meeting, and one of them is that because 
newborn mortalities slower than child mortality, slower than maternal mortality, we've got a major problem. And then preterm birth, as we understand it at the moment, is the second largest leading cause of under five deaths. So again, hopefully we don't need to be convinced that we have a major burden. Now, for many people, the currency that we deal in is how many deaths, the money. But for families, there's also a tremendous long-term impact on survivors. The physical effects, visual impairments, hearing impairments, lung problems, cardiovascular ill health, sometimes even extending into late middle age, the neurodevelopmental, neurobehavioral problems. And perhaps the, maybe the least documented are the family and societal effects, which for any of you who happen to look after children, who have the privilege of looking after children, I don't think that there's any elaboration on. It can be devastating for families. In fact, some people, have been provocative enough to say there's some things worse than death. And so I leave you with that thought to reflect on. So what has been some of the work, what has been some of the thinking around this issue? Well, we've heard at various points over the last couple of days about the Born Too Soon report, which was launched last year. This is a tremendous bending of the curve, that I, I like the, the, the term that Lily used yesterday, different epochs of time where in newborn health, the curve has been bent. This is, for me, one of them. It was a truly global report. It was, had a tremendous number of organizations involved, tremendous participation. Again, if anything emphasizes the strength of partnerships, I think this report would be one of them. And it linked to just about everything going on within the, the different initiatives going on, which is critically important, because again, it keeps everyone aligned on the arc. Now, out of that effort, there was a tremendous amount of energy, there was a tremendous amount of momentum. And Two groups, actually very small groups, initially were formed to try to channel this, this momentum, this energy, this thinking into some really it's, it's things that are a little more tangible, that are a little more actionable, that were continuing to move the agenda so that, again, we wouldn't run into the situation where it would be a beautiful report sitting somewhere, periodically pulled out and polished. And the two groups that came out of this effort were a care group where the purpose was to really try to understand a little bit better what the best buys were. Analogous to what Joy had mentioned, analogous to some of the themes we've heard so far. Um, there was an initial core membership of some of the key suspects and players, the UNICEF, WHO, Saving Newborn Lives, USID, the foundation, uh, some professional bodies. And much of that energy was harnessed into conceptualizing the global newborn action with a plan. Again, I, I, I can't say this enough. Everything we do that has plan, movement, statement, and unless we have action involved with it, a lot of us who work in very rural areas are skeptical because we want to see, we keep asking ourselves a question, how does it get to the people who need it most? The other group that um, came out of this was a research group where the, the purpose was to try to think through what the research may mean in all settings high-income, low-income, middle-income countries, and where the key value adds could be. Um, there was an initial stakeholder uh, meeting, 
uh, in the summer of last year. And then in January of this year, there was a, a gathering of some of the most, uh, some of the thought leaders, some of the major researchers in preterm health. Um, and, and the goal at that point, these are the leading researchers in all the different countries who work in the preterm space. And the goal was not just to get together and talk academic talk, but to get together and to actually populate what many of us call a solution pathway. So not an academic, intellectual, ivory tower pathway, but a solution pathway, because it's about solutions. The effort is ongoing because it's pretty monumental. And I'll just give you a sort of quick overview of some of the first pass thinking that came out of that. But further than that, one of the challenges we've seen in many global health initiatives has been that where the funders come in, the funding process can be a little haphazard. And so the goals, the ideas, the plan now is to have a funders meeting in the summer where the solution pathway has been fully populated and we're in a coordinated fashion, again, partnerships, in a coordinated fashion, the funders can strategically look through the solution pathway and fund it as strategically as possible. Mm -hmm. I think that's a laudable goal. The Born Too Soon report was in May of last year. The care group started off in soon after that, in June, July. Then we had World Prematurity Day in November. And for those of you who are aware of it, it was a phenomenal success in that, again, it reached 1.4 billion people. And the question that I think many of us have is, how does that get leveraged? How does get, that get transformed into some sort of action, into some sort of process that has meaning? And, and many of you will agree that as we raise understanding, as we raise awareness amongst all the constituencies, that's one of the most powerful ways to begin to drive policy change. So I've talked a little bit about the preterm burden and given you a sense of some of the activities, processes, thinking that's going on um, in that space. And let me just touch a little bit on the implementation and research horizons. So I, I may just be the 46th person this in the last two days to start talking again about the big two. Uh, in some cases, the tip of the spear, as it were, which would be antenatal corticosteroids and kangaroo mother care. Yeah, and, and, and this concept is not to at all diminish the importance of the others, but to use this purely as a starting point, as a hook, as a link-in, to be able to work together in a, in a best buy situation here. So, kangaroo mother care means a lot of things to a lot of people. Uh, for many, it means continuous skin-to-skin -skin care. Uh, it includes exclusive breastfeeding, and it includes supportive care for the mother and the infant diet. And by supportive, I mean that proactive assessment of the mother, proactive assessment of the baby, both physically, mentally, emotionally, making sure that that diet, again, that partnership, are being supported. I don't think there's the need to try to convince you with the data anymore. Um, I hopefully you've all been bludgeoned enough by the data, um, whether it's mortality, whether it's infections, whether it's growth, whether it's hypothermia, 
there's pretty strong data out there. It's a tremendously effective entry point of care for little babies. And as Joy mentioned, and as many of you have heard, if taken to scale, the number of babies that that could save is huge. But for an intervention that has been known for 35 years, uh, th it, it, there isn't wide scale use of this. Why is that? There's some barriers that are clear that we need to think about, we need to address. And I don't want you to read all this. I just want you to be aware of some of these barriers. A couple of analyses have been done. A couple of papers have been written in the past on them. I think they probably distill into maybe three or four main categories. We don't have a coordinated global community around this. Again, partnerships, because strengthen partnerships. And in some cases, frankly, I think the medical community has been perhaps responsible for trying to over-professionalize, over-medicalize this very relatively simple intervention. Not easy, but too hard, too fragile, too little, too this, too that. Maybe we need to rethink around how to get there. We certainly, and I know we, we, it was mentioned by Joy, it was mentioned by Gary yesterday, it's been mentioned by Anne-Marie, it's been mentioned by anyone who's tried to think around KMC. What do we even, how can we track that? What sort of measurements do we have? What sort of national policies are there with m and &E components? Relatively little. And, and then we have this almost dichotomous way of thinking around KMC. Is it facility? Is it community? And yet that is so artificial, isn't it? I mean, it's a continuum. And it's bi-directional. People start off in a facility, within six hours they're in a community, they start off in a community, they get to a facility. There's great movement around that. We need to try and understand that better and maybe again rethink through how we frame this. Um, and the great news is there are actions that are w actively going on as we speak to begin to overcome these barriers. There are numerous initiatives going on, there are numerous people getting together, even at this meeting as we speak. Um, there's an awareness, there's this idea of promoting the culture or the bi-directional culture that we've talked about of community and facility. And it doesn't just stop, this is implementation, right? But it doesn't just stop there. The groundswell continues amongst even the researchers. The WHO took a chinry exercise, you know, this is one of those exercises where you get some of the leading practitioners and researchers get them together and say, what is the biggest problem in preterm birth? What can you most, do, most quickly do to best do? What questions need to be answered? And again, it was KMC. Top, very top question. And all the questions around newborn health, again, KMC came up in the top two. So critical point. Similarly, Joy talked about um, antenatal corticosteroids. We're going to have a session about it later on. Um, groundswell of information, groundswell of data coming out. Something that we've had for 35 years, and yet we don't have wide-scale approach to it. Again, there are some actions to it. We've heard about the C Commodities Commission. We've heard about the essential medicines list. Things are beginning to move. On the research side, I, I talked about a solution pathway. Um, and, and this was just to give you a very quick perspective on what it may, maybe a straw man sketch of what it may look like. Um, trying to understand preterm birth and its discovery, and its development, and its delivery. Um, and, and, and watch that space, because that's going to keep uh, moving. So what are some of the research horizons that are probably going to fill the gaps of known interventions over the next few years? Well, 
let me just highlight to you a cervical opacity. We had a lovely publication in the Lancet last year. And you know, the pessary is used to produce, pr provide structural support for the cervix. Um, and at all stages, whether 28 weeks, 32 weeks, 34 weeks, it showed a strong, positive, significant means of reducing uh, preterm birth at all points. Similarly, progesterone injections, again, Whatever your profile was, we had another publication not so long ago, which showed by, by, by Dodd et al., which showed, again, significant be benefits. Th th these are still in the early stages, but watch this space. Th th there are some exciting things coming on on the research horizons. I do want to make a plug, though, because many people, when they think of preterm births, as I say, as we mentioned at the very beginning, we talk about preterm birth as any one born below 37 weeks of gestation. But let me make a plug for the late preterm birth. The, the infant who's born between 32 and 36 weeks. And that actually is, are the majority of babies who are preterm, 85% in one analysis. And the Oxford Intergrowth Group came up with this composite of perinatal mortality and a morbidity index, so a perinatal mortality and morbidity index, which constituted fetal death, neonatal death at less, greater than seven days, and being in the NICU. And at, you may be able to see this, but at 35 weeks, the index was nearly 17, 17 times higher than a 40 weeks. So what I provoke us to start thinking about also is this artificial divide of 37 weeks. We almost want to be e emphasizing that babies need to be born at 40 weeks. So as I wind up my last couple of slides, <laughs> I just come back to the same theme again. And, and if, if, if we can go back, if we can all leave this conference understanding this, I think it would have been a major ingredient for our, for our success in the years to come. We cannot take newborn health in isolation. We need to take that holistic, panoramic view that involves these catalytic partnerships. As someone who's privileged to continue to look after little citizens in different country settings, I don't look at a baby and say, okay, you, you don't have birth asphyxia. I'm not interested in what you do with feeding. Or you have malaria, and let's deal with that, but don't really care about lung pulmonary problems. We need to have, it's all holistic. It's all part of that partnership. So what can you do? What can we do? Many of you are policymakers. Many of you have tremendous influence on in policy. Um, I think one of the critical links that we need to really think about is to provide a positive policy environment. All too often we have research, we have sub-district level programs, etc., but they don't get, we don't have the positive national level policy environment for change. And yesterday, one of the keys that we found in all the, I heard in all the different countries who are on target to meet Millennium Development Goals was that positive policy framework. That's something that you can do. That's something that we can work on. Programmatically, the two best buys, antenatal corticosteroids, kangaroo mother care, and then the big aspects of them, trying to understand, trying to measure and trying to focus on the quality of care. Unfortunately, we'll have more conversations about quality of care. We'll have more conversations about measurement in this conference. And then again, purpose-driven partnerships, be it nutrition, malaria, education, RMNCH. So the task isn't impossible, right? <laughs> and I love this little proverb. A single spider weaves a web and catches one fly. Many spiders weave a web, catch an elephant, catch the big five, 
plop them all in that ark. <laughs> oh. And we make progress. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen.